about biblical manhood. And uh, that's, that's kind of a generic word. You know, we're, we're men of faith, and, you know, we're men, and uh, we, we profess to live our lives as Christ does, as commanded us to us, as the Bible has. So um, let's welcome Daryl and Rod, and again, welcome Nick. So guys, let's have a conversation here about biblical manhood. Um, Daryl, let's start with you. Um, can you share with us what your view of a man was growing up? You kind of touched on it the other night about growing up, dad wasn't exactly the best dad that you can get an example for you, but what was that view of just manhood? Not biblical manhood, just manhood growing up. Well, I, I think it was really empty, you know, just the manhood of growing up in my house, you know, my dad was absent, and, you know, he didn't see me play Little League or anything like that, so I pretty much had to grow up, you know, really the hard way of learning, the hard knocks of growing up and, and just becoming who I decided to become, so I didn't really know what it was like to have a father, and that was pretty challenging for me, but, you know, I think growing up and where I grew up at in South Central, it made me realize either you're going to get out of here or you're not, you know, and that was a very difficult area where I grew up in Los Angeles. So I ended up growing up with some real hard knocks and real trouble, you know, real, real troubling inside about who I was and the identity of what I was and, and, and what I could become. Um, I was raised by my mom. So um, being raised by my mom really made me become tough inside, you know, because like I said, when guys don't have a father around, it's very difficult for you to find out who you are and, and what, what the purpose of life is, really is. And, and I struggle with that. I struggle with that to, to understand what manhood was like. You know, I was very talented, just, just like most of you guys. All of us have this natural gift, you know, that God has given us, and what do we do with it? Um, you know, we put on a uniform, we play baseball, but that don't really make me a man. It makes me a baseball player. You know, and mm -hmm. I, I really always wanted to find out the importance of who I was as a man. So I, I didn't know it, I didn't know all of that when I was growing up. I was going through this whole process of figuring out, you know, who am I? You know, even in my whole career, my Major League Baseball career, I wasn't a man in, in, until I met Jesus, you know. And I was just a baseball player all those years of playing baseball and, and winning championships and doing great things, but it didn't make me a man. You know, yeah. just made me a baseball player. And I think sometimes we get confused with that. And, and that's why I see so many guys that really can't never, you know, uh, cross over into what it is to be a man and take off the uniform and, and stand on platforms and, 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 and live like a man, live according to the biblical principles. Because it's hard. Because you, if you haven't come to that place of dying, and that's that Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who, you know, it's that Galatians 2.20. Yeah. About, about, I mean, I mean, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Yeah. And it's Christ who rules and reigns. And after you come into that place of having this relationship with Christ, uh, your life is going to be transformed in such a different way. And you'll step into this place of being a man and knowing, knowing how to uh, love your wife and, and, and love your kids and, and, and love what you do and, and don't let it have you, you know. And I think in my career, my career had me, you know, I was... Uh, a young star, and, and, and it had me, and I, I really didn't understand the manhood until after all the things that happened to me, and then my life had a transformation, and after the transformation, I became the man that God wanted me to be. Yeah, that's good. Let me stick with baseball for a second. Nick, you're in the midst of your career right now, um, but what did that look like for you? What was your view of manhood, maybe even biblical manhood as a, as a kid growing up? Yeah, um, I didn't really have a view of biblical manhood. Uh, I didn't have a view of the Bible growing up. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a dad in the household, uh, was, a, was a good dad by most standards, but uh, didn't set any type of example spiritually. Um, didn't set a good example in, in some regards, but uh, he was there, he was present, uh, and I'm really appreciative of that for him, uh, from him. Um, so like I said, I didn't have a, a biblical view growing up, but, but I'm thankful that he was there and present for me. Pastor Rod. You're pastoring now, you're, you're talking to a lot of different people in a lot of different stages of life, but what about you and your sort of view of manhood and how it's evolved and changed over the years? Yeah, my, my view of manhood, which began obviously in my childhood, I grew up in the projects in Norfolk, Virginia. My, my most essential view of manhood was absenteeism. So 
I didn't meet my father until uh, just a few months before I got married. I was 25, 24 mm. when I got married. So I met him for the first time a few months before I got married. And in the community where I grew up, men sort of came in and went out. And so they came in at their leisure. They came in for their pleasure. Somebody will get that. Um, and then they left when they were done. And so my view of manhood was that men conquered women, right, that they lived leisurely, they drank, they hang out, um, but not a sense of responsibility. I never saw um, a, a weighty uh, view of a man being responsible toward his family. And interestingly, what it left me with is a resolution in my life. I remember sitting on the, it was a pea green washing machine in my mother's kitchen. Uh, somebody, somebody remember that from the 70s. <laughs> and, and I said to myself, sitting there, I will never leave my wife and my children. I didn't know anyone who was married. But I just knew that someday I would be a husband and a father, and I would never leave them. And that was my resolution. That's how I learned. Uh, that was my example of mm. manhood. Um, I grew up in a household with a broken family, and my dad wasn't exactly in my life either. And I always said, Daryl, when I became a dad, I just wanted to do the opposite of what my dad didn't do or be there for me, right? I said, okay, I'm gonna, I don't know how, I don't have a great example of being a man, but I'm just going to do whatever I didn't get that example of when I became a dad. What was that like for you as you started to, you came to father at a young age, and, and you're in the midst of your baseball career, and I know Christ got a hold of you around 91 is when you accepted Christ. What did that do for you growing up without a dad in terms of then suddenly becoming a father? Oh, that's a good question because, you know, without having a father in the household, you know, and my father was an alcoholic and, you know, he, was, he wasn't a nice guy. And, and I said the same thing, you know, I would never be like that, but I ended up turning out being just like him, mm. you know, because I didn't have a foundation in my life. And, and the, the importance of having a foundation is, is the biblical foundations, of course, but if you don't see a dad in the house and you don't see what it looks like, you know, having a man around the house, then you don't really know what it looks like. So for me, that means it, it looked like, like you said, I could do whatever I want. You know, I had multiple women, relationships, womanizer I became, just like him, married, adultery, you know, just living a life. And, I thought that's just the way it was. You know, I played Major League Baseball, and they said, here, you can have whatever you like. You know, and most of the time, most of us will do that. You know, we end up tasting and seeing everything else out there uh, because we don't have a foundation and don't understand who we really are. Um, we think, well, this is just the way life is, you know. I'm making millions of dollars, so I could do actually whatever I want to do. You know, and, and that's what I, I grew up like because I, I didn't have a father figure to be able to, um, sit me down and saying, son, you can pick your sins, but you can't pick your consequences. You know, we don't, we don't really ever think about that. Well, I, I never thought about that part. And the consequences are so real, you know, well, picking my sins. Um, and not only becoming a father, you know, it affected my children. Um, but today, you know, because I'm, you know, a wholesome guy now, a new guy, a new man in Christ, you know, uh, my children are not affected anymore. You break the curse off of them. See, you, one thing we don't understand, guys, you will affect your children with your actions. Mm -hmm. it, it will come out and, and affect their lives with the way you live and what happens in your career. Um, if you live according to the principles, uh, the principal standards, you know, your life, the biblical principles, your life, uh, for your family it should be the most important thing. You know, that's what we represent. I mean, I represent that today, but I didn't when I was a young player, when I was playing at the height of my career, you know, that, that life told me you can have whatever you wanted. I, you know, guess what? I ended up with two broken marriages. I ended up hurting six kids. You know why? Because I was selfish, self-centered, because I was Daryl Strawberry, the great baseball player, you know, with no foundation. So you end up there lost out there and, and you don't end up being the person that God had created you to be, because God created us for something great, and it's greater than just being a baseball player and putting a uniform on. Nick, uh, for you, you didn't grow up in a Christian home per se, uh, and I know your story, and I quickly share your testimony, because uh, it's a long one, obviously, there's a lot that goes into it, but I love your testimony and your story, but then 
Take it from there after you become a believer, after you start this walk with, with God. How does your view of manhood become into the world of biblical manhood? How does that change for you? But share your testimony a little bit first and then take us to the, the part on manhood. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to keep it quick. Uh, so I grew up in the Catholic Church a little bit. Anybody go to Catholic Church growing up? All right, so um, my grandparents still to this day go to Catholic Church every morning, just ritualistic routine over and over and over again. Mm. Um, and that kind of got passed down to my parents. Uh, my mom would basically try to drag us to church every Sunday morning, and my two brothers and I would be kicking and screaming, you know, making her late pretty much every Sunday because we didn't want to go. So uh, I was in church, but I didn't want to be there. I had no relationship with God. Then I left to go to college uh, and got drafted and played professionally. I had no faith. Uh, I was on my own. I just started to walk away completely uh, and do my own thing, uh, just play baseball and focus on that. And then uh, I started to realize what I wanted uh, since I was three or four years old. All I wanted to do was play professional baseball. And I was having that opportunity. I was doing it. I was living it. Uh, but I realized on the inside I was still empty. I was still missing something. Uh, I didn't really know what it was. I just knew I'd, there's got to be something more. This can't be it. Um, so I started to go to baseball chapel. I got invited to go. I went, you know, once in a month, and then the next month I think I went twice. And uh, over the course of the next two or three years, uh, I, I went to some Bible studies on the road, which was super awkward and uncomfortable the first time. I was like, <laughs> what am I doing here? Yeah. Um, but I just started to get the word kind of poured into me. I had people around me kind of showed me how to be a man, uh, you know, in the game of baseball. You know, still love your wife. Be a great dad. Be a great husband. Treat the people with respect around you, uh, but still be excellent and be really good at your job. So uh, I started to get a different view of manhood from that regard, uh, and I actually gave my life to Christ in the middle of a bunch of different stuff, just struggling really bad with uh, being traded, fitting into a new team, doing a long-distance relationship with my wife. We were engaged at the time, and we were having a lot of trouble, uh, and then going through the worst uh, the worst failure, I think, on the field in the history of baseball for a two-month period. So I was as bad as it gets, and, and I'd go home every night at the end of the game, and I'd be like, all right, God, that was not God at the time. But I'd just stare at the ceiling and be like, <laughs> yeah. you know what? That's the last baseball game I'm ever going to play. I'm going to show up tomorrow, get released, and the dream's going to be over. Uh, so I felt like I was losing the dream. Uh, and then it was one night. It was down in Mobile, Alabama. Uh, in the middle of the game, between the fourth and fifth inning, I went out <clears throat> Went out to shortstop to take ground balls between innings to warm up. Uh, didn't do that for some reason. Just turned around and faced the outfield and closed my eyes on the middle of the field, in the middle of the game, and gave my life to Christ right then and there. So um, no matter where you guys are at, if you've done that uh, or haven't done that yet, uh, it doesn't have to be in a church. It doesn't have to be here. It can be anywhere, any place, any time, and God's going to take you just as you are uh, and then mold you and shape you into be more like Christ. I love that story. I mean, how often does that, who gives their life to Christ in the middle of a baseball game? <laughs> it's such a great story. And you did it, and that's awesome. And God gets a hold of you. But then, now, what's your view of manhood like? How does that change now that you have this? And obviously, it's a process. I always tell people, yeah, they get on fire for God and all that. But it is a process to begin this walk with the Lord, and it's a never-ending process. What's the view of manhood start to look like for you now, though, that you be are walking with God. Yeah, it's obviously very different. Kind of like uh, Daryl was saying, I was basically living for myself and my own career and my own pleasures. Um, you know, I was a terrible, at the time, fiance. I was a really bad teammate, just treating people like crap. Um, you know, not a good son and brother and all those things. And, and God started to kind of flip the script on a lot of those things. Mm. Uh, and I started to study who Jesus was. And I was praying a little bit this morning, knowing I'd get asked a question along these lines. And thinking about what to say, and I feel like God was just saying, like, Jesus didn't come to be served. And I think in this situation that we're in a lot, uh, you know, we have people serving us all day long. You know, as players, we have, you know, clubbies, we have agents, we have whoever and anybody and everybody that wants to basically serve us and help us. And we can fall into that pattern of just accepting it. Uh, and Jesus goes into Matthew 20 and talking about uh, how the people were lordshipping and ruling over those people and exercising their authority. Uh, and I think that's what I was doing in, in my position before Christ. Uh, and now after that, I'm trying to do the opposite. I'm trying to just live like Jesus and be a servant, uh, no matter who the person is, no matter what status they have, just love on them the same way. And uh, I shared this analogy with somebody a couple years ago. We're on a plane flight uh, going across country, and we're just talking about the Bible, talking about different things, and this analogy just popped into my head. I think it was obviously God kind of giving it to me. 
Uh, and it was like, if you're in a clubhouse and there's nobody else in there and there's two different people walk in, two different scenarios, one of them is the owner of your team, right, the guy with the billion-dollar checkbook who can basically get rid of you anytime he wants. He can, you know, give you a contract extension, whatever. The owner of the team comes in, and the next guy comes in as the bat boy or the guy who cleans the toilets. Are you going to act the same? Are you going to speak to them the same? Are you going to treat them the exact same way? And I think that was a big test and challenge to my heart because uh, there's definitely times where I don't treat those two types of people the same. And I realize not everybody here is, is a player in a clubhouse on a daily basis, but we all have different people like that in our lives. So uh, just a challenge to me as a man, like, hey, am I treating, you know, that person who can do nothing for me the exact same as the person who can hold my future in his hand? Mm, that's really well said. Pastor Rod, um, What's missing in men today? What do you think's missing? You didn't tell me you were going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> I said, do you what's want to know the questions? I'm happy to tell you. <laughs> I love it. What, what's missing in men? Um, I think there are a couple of things missing that we, we desperately need. In my, my book, Cover Her, I, I, I identify five essential things for manhood in terms of our roles. Um, it's praise, it's provision, it's protection, it's proclamation, and it's presentation. And I want to talk about the proclamation one in particular. Mm. I think our culture of manhood is missing um, the guts and the balls to stand up for what's hard. Mm. I, think, I think largely we, we're so given to what's comfortable. That's why I love this conference. Right, we've been talking about getting out of our comfort zones, but, but proclamation has to do with speaking up for people who can't speak up for themselves. Speaking up when somebody is wrong, right? Standing um, for justice where there's injustice. I was talking with one of uh, the players uh, who was with me uh, our Super Bowl run back in um, 13, and he stood up in a team meeting and said something very difficult. Coach opened up the floor, anybody that got anything to say? A couple of guys started sharing some concerns they had about how things were going. He stood up, he said, he said, you know, coach, I just wanna say that we've been talking about brotherhood. We've been talking about standing up for one another. He says, and the way that you treated this guy on the sideline, he said, man, that was really demeaning. He's like, that, that's not how, he said, that's not what we've been talking about. And he didn't know it, but years later, he's been labeled for that. And he said, man, what did I do wrong? I said, I don't think you did anything wrong. Maybe you executed wrongly, but in principle, you stood for something hard, right? You spoke up for a guy who had, this guy had no leverage on the team. He had no position. And he answered a question, but he became labeled. I said, you, you were willing to go to bat for somebody else who wasn't going to be able to go to bat for themselves. And I think more of us can do that. And sometimes it's not a vocal word, right? Sometimes it's we create a strategy in the background where we say, let's lift up those who don't have a platform, who don't have um, justice coming their way. But we create an avenue where the least of these can be uh, esteemed and valued. Uh, so I think that's one of the things that we have to do in our culture is we have to be willing to speak up where it's hard. Um, to really proclaim, and I think that's what uh, the whole spirit of justice, Isaiah and Amos, uh, Jesus, Paul, right, where we will, we will say sometimes a thing that no one wants to hear um, because we know it's the right thing to say. Hmm. Daryl, same question for you. What do you think's missing in men today? Well I, well, I get a chance to travel and do a lot of men's conference, and I think what, what is really missing is the commitment. Uh, of a man and his, his relationship with Christ and, and not being afraid of what others may think. I think a lot of time we're more uh, concerned about what others think about us because we're believers and, and, and we, live for, we live for God and we don't live for worldly standards. Um, and, we, and men compromise, even those believers compromise to make the other guys feel a little bit better, you know, I want to be a part uh, of what they're doing, you know, and, and I say that as a team because I know what it's like being on a team, I know what it's like being on a bus, I know what it's like being on the plane, 
I know who's in the back of the plane and I know who's in the front of the plane. You know, which one do I decide? You know, am I gonna compromise? Am I gonna go back? Cause these guys are, you know, in the back and they're partying, they're drinking, you know, or, you know, see, see me, I was always in the back. You know, Hojo don't know that. You know, I was always, in, I was always lost with the lost crowd, you know, and when, when I was playing in my days and, and I wish, and then there was Gary Carter, he was always sitting in the front and everybody was, you know, joking about him drinking milk because he smiled all the time. Mm -hmm. But what we didn't realize was that he was free. Players didn't realize that until after he died, how free he really was and the victory he had. So you guys have a chance, some of you that are still playing, you have a chance to be the example of what it's like to be committed to Christ all in and not worrying about what others may think. Let them think whatever they're gonna think. Because let me tell you guys, we're all gonna die. We're all getting out of here. Where are you going? Do you know, do you know, do you really know who Jesus is? Do you know the purpose of you being created and the platform that God has given you? God has given you a tremendous platform, every last one of you. You played baseball or whatever. God has given you a tremendous platform as a man to live according to the biblical principles if I commit to it, if I understand. Yeah, we get the temptations. Well, Jesus was tempted too, just like all the rest of us. Matthew 4, 4, the enemy tempted him. He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. See, it is the word of God that gives you the victory over everything else. Yeah. And I think some of us sit around and we don't believe it is the word, it is the scriptures that sends you into a place of being victorious. And then other guys will look at you when they see that your heart is committed, that you're serious about it, they'll want what you have. See, I wanted what Gary Carter had. I just didn't know how to get there. Man, you guys have a place. You come here. You should have more players. You should have influence. You should have more major league players in here, in this room. If we'd have had a place like this when we were playing at the time, I'm quite sure more guys would have got saved if we'd have told them about the gospel and they would have been able to come to an increased conference, that life can be changed. Because it's not all about the status. It's not all about the success. It's about, you know, it's about at the end of the day, is my life, is my life a living testimony of who Christ is? That's what it all boils down to. Not how many home runs I hit, trophies I hit, have. It, the legacy that you don't want, I don't want to leave a legacy about baseball. I'm trying to leave a legacy to my kids that Jesus is Lord. That's the legacy, not, not me, you know, being this great baseball player because I finally committed my life to Christ and I finally committed myself to the Bible. Hey, guys, the Bible is powerful, more powerful than the home runs I ever hit. And I hit quite a few of them in my days. But that Bible is very powerful. And I challenge you. I challenge you to challenge other players, to help other players make a commitment to Christ himself because at the end of the day, because that's what God's going to account us for is about winning souls. And, and we all, all of us have a great responsibility, man. I, I would just hate for you to walk out of here and, and not know that it, there's a great responsibility for you to live according uh, to what, what you have learned from the Bible and God saved you and, and you're still not living according to that. I mean, I, mean, I, I live that life. Matter of fact, I don't even like baseball anymore. I've been preaching for nine years, so there's no baseball inside of me anymore. But I wish you guys well. I wish you guys use, you know, the, the platform that you have to, to have the impact, to have the kingdom impact that you can have. You can have such a great, great kingdom impact, and that's what God's going to account you for. He's not going to account you for anything else. Yeah, no. well said. Um, as we wind down, uh, Nick, you know, you hear a lot about vulnerability and transparency and authenticity, and you've especially at a conference like this and a place like this where we're, we're supposed to tear down the walls and take off the mask and just open up. But that's really hard when we leave here, especially when a season starts, for a baseball player to go in and just be that guy, that authentic, transparent guy. Can you just encourage the people listening, because they'll be listening outside of here, and the people in this room, um, why it's important to be that way, be transparent and authentic in your walk with Jesus, uh, and just encourage these guys. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's funny you're, you're asking that question. I was about to ask you to jump in and, and speak about that being missing uh, in men. Uh, so God's obviously here. He's, he's moving, and it's something important uh, to be vulnerable. Anybody uh, had a good experience with somebody that 
uh, was boasting or talking proudly about themselves? Nobody, right? <laughs> like, you don't get close to somebody when they're tooting their own horn and talking about how great they are, right? The closeness in the relationship happens when you let the veil down and you actually let people in and say, hey, man, I'm struggling with this or, you know, this is going on in my life. And that's how real growth happens. And uh, the first guy, I think he's in here somewhere, Brian Hommel, our chaplain in Arizona, uh, he was one of the first guys who really showed me how to do that. Um, and he just would come to chapel and he would just lay it all out there. He talked about how he yelled at his kids and he talked about how he struggled with his sex life and he talked about whatever. Sorry, I'm putting you on the spot, Hom. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he talked about everything. Um, and he, he talked about his struggles. There he is right there. Um, sorry, Hom. <laughs> yeah, but he just laid it all out there and he just invites people in. If you guys don't know him, uh, he's a guy to get to know, man. And he, he invites people in with his authenticity and his realness and his raw you know, just being himself and just letting people know that, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a chaplain. I know the word of God, but I still struggle with this and that. And uh, the relationships he forms and develops are, are priceless because yeah. of it. Pastor Rod, as we close here, why don't you give a word of encouragement for the guys um, as we wind down? Yeah, the word I, I would say is you're enough. You're enough. For all the guys who struggle with their identity Right? We, can't, we wear these masks, as Nick talked about, because we wonder if people will accept us if they really knew who we were. And I just want to say, man, you're enough. Right? God accepts you. He welcomes you. His arms are open to you. He's not, he's not against you. He's for you, and you are enough. Right? Whether, whether they give you the big contract or not, right? whether you have the great career or not, right? God sees you as having extraordinary value. And it has nothing to do with how beautiful your girl is. I know I'm talking real good right now. Because you know, we want a dime piece. Because we like, if I got a dime on my hands, then that makes me the man, right? <laughs> if I got a dime piece, I'm the dude, right? We start popping our collars, but you're enough whether you got a dime piece or not, right? You're enough whether you drive the right car, live in the right neighborhood, know the right people, have the right connections. You are enough for God to love as you are. Man, pull that mask down. Because on the, see, vulnerability is the gateway to transformation. I think you said it well, right? As soon as I can be vulnerable, as soon as I can pull the mask down, as soon as I can say, Jesus, I really need you, right? No matter what they see, I'm a jacked up joker. And I got a need. He will step right in. He says, I've been waiting all your life for you to say that. And I'm here for you. I love you. I've been, I've been waiting for this moment. Um, and so I just want to say, man, you're enough, dude. You're enough, right? Um, you don't have to do anything else for God to love you. And you can't make him stop loving you. Mm. We give it up for these guys.